Hi there, I'm Sam Ashkenazi, and I'm sitting here with Ryan Belrose, Indigenous Rights Activist, and thank you for uh, taking time to speak with us today. No worries, I appreciate it. For sure. So, uh, I wanted to discuss with you a couple of things. There's obviously a lot going on in Canada right now with the uh, pipeline protests, and I thought it would be a good idea for people to um, just hear, you know, sort of the other perspective about what's going on with the protests. What, what does some of these words mean that they're hearing a lot of the news? What is a hereditary chief? You know, what is it like for First Nations communities in Canada? Um, you know, just some of the some of the background. But first, sure. you know, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, okay, so I am Métis. I grew up on Paddle Prairie Métis Settlement, which is in the far north in Alberta. Uh, there are several Métis settlements in Alberta, but that's not actually where we're from. Uh, mm-hmm. Actual Métis people are from the Red River in Manitoba. Mm-hmm. But we were forced to go west, and when when we actually negotiated with the government, the land that they gave us uh, was technically on somebody else's ancestral land, but they gave us that land in order to uh, secure a land base for the Métis people. And so what, what's the difference between uh, Métis and First Nations, Indigenous? What are some of these uh, things, distinctions? Okay, so the easiest way to explain it is, is actually to use Indian Act terminology. It's not maybe the best way to do it, but it, it's the easiest way to understand it. So there's status and non-status Indians. Now, a status Indian is somebody who's covered under treaty. They they come from a band that signed treaty with the government, mm-hmm. so they are protected under the Indian Act as status Indians. So the way we were always taught was Bill C-31. So Bill C-31 status Indian is somebody who's fully protected and covered under treaty. Non-status Indians included anybody that wasn't. So say you were a native woman and you married a white man. Your kids would not be status. Now, under the Indian Act, right up until I believe the, the late 60s, the woman would lose her native status as well. So then even really? if she divorced, yeah, even if she divorced the man that she married, she would not be able to be native anymore. So, so she couldn't live on the reserve. Legally, they've taken her identity away. You're, exactly. You're done. Yeah, so it would have been all gone. So a lot of times what happened is those women had children and they were divorced and they had nowhere to go. So a lot of times uh, Métis communities would take them in, even though they're not technically Métis. You know, to, the truth was we understood what it was like to be, you know, have nowhere to go. And after the after the Red River Rebellion, a lot of us lived with our native relatives. So like a lot of Métis people actually moved with the Cree and they lived among, mm-hmm. you know, pound makers band, big bears band. Like so that that's why we you know, we don't generally tend to look at that the same way that non native people do. Now the issue is for Métis people, the government says that anybody who is of mixed blood is Métis. So if you have native blood of any sort mixed with European blood, according to the government, you can claim that you're Métis. Now, the reason we find that to be insulting is because we believe that indigeneity is site-specific. Okay, every and, indigenous, and what does that mean? So that means that every indigenous person in the world, every indigenous tribe, every indigenous people has ties to a specific place, to a specific land. Now, if we are going to be consistent, that means that as native as Métis people, we have to have the same standards, the same consistent standards. So we believe that our people come from the Red River. So it's it's we if somebody says, you know, I'm half Blackfoot and French, that means I'm Métis. Not necessarily. Now, if you have ties and connections to an ancestral Métis homeland, then and a family, then we would say absolutely you are. But if you don't then you would just be Blackfoot. Like, you're, you're part Blackfoot and part European. There's nothing wrong with that. It just means you're not one of us. Okay? Mm. Now, the problem is that the government has pushed this narrative, and now you have groups of people who are not Métis in any way, shape, or form. They don't have connections to our language. They don't have connections to our ancestral land. Mm-hmm. They don't have any blood connections. But they claim that they're Métis in order to get hunting rights or fishing rights. And unfortunately, a lot of times they make arguments that are damaging to other Native people because they're not really concerned about that, mm-hmm. right? And and especially in the last couple of years, there's been this movement that we call the Pretendian Movement. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's people that claim to be Native in order to gain some nebulous benefit that quite often doesn't even really exist. So it's the, as a, as a Native person, as a First Nations person. Yeah, as an Indian, you know. And, and we're seeing it a lot right now with this pipeline stuff. Uh, you know, the truth of the matter is, like, oh, oh, sorry, I, I don't want to digress too much. <laughs> no problem, you know, no problem. The truth of the matter is there's status and non-status Indians. So non-status Indians, uh, that used to just include everybody that wasn't a treaty Indian, and mm-hmm. Métis was part of that. 
now it non-status Indians they've changed that recently with the Delgamuk mm -hmm. uh, uh, legal case. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's also other cases where we took the government uh, to task about trying to tell us who we are. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is, Sam, that for Indigenous people, the only people who should get to determine who is a member of an Indigenous people are those people. So, mm -hmm. like, you're Jewish. Sure. I would never, ever, ever try to tell you how you should identify Jewish people. Like, what makes mm -hmm. a Jewish person Jewish? Yeah, I would what's never, the criteria and what's, yeah, what's sure. the criteria? How do you determine who's a Jew? Mm -hmm. The only people who should be determining who's a Jew are Jews, right? The only people that should be determining who's Métis are Métis people. The only people that should determine who's Blackfoot should be Blackfoot people. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that now with everybody getting involved in these things, everybody feels like they're an expert, especially on social mm -hmm. media. And they don't really dig into these things. They don't figure stuff out. So I, I started to talk a little bit about yeah, that. So <laughs> the truth of the matter is Native people are not monolithic in any way, shape, or form. So in, in the case of the pipelines, you, you only see the, the, the activist people, right? So you see the people that are loud and, and are pushing their, their point of view. So that means with Native people, nine times out of ten, you'll see very environmentally... You know, like they act like the environment's the only thing that matters, those kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Where in reality, in Indian country, it's a lot more diverse. So you do have people that support the pipelines. You have people that work, and they have jobs, and they've worked in the oil field, and, and forestry, and all those different industries. Travis, and you also have some experience. You're speaking for personal experience. Yeah, like, so my, my own family, right? Like, my dad ran an oil field services company. He transitioned more into doing cleanups and stuff like that, but the truth of the matter is, like, we, we worked in pipelines, we worked in the lease building, you know, uh, forestry, we did true, like, we tr we planted forests, that's what we did. So, you know, like, it's it's not as cut and dry as people think. And and what's really, really sad is that it's become so divisive, because, like, if, if somebody like me steps up and says, you know, I'm not going to condemn my uncle for working in the oil field, because that's what he does to feed his family, Right. People will say stuff to me like, well, you're a government agent or you're an Uncle Tom. Mm. And I'm like, no, I'm literally just stating the truth. I mean, I moved to the city. I sold my car because I felt strongly enough that I could use public transportation. Mm. You know, there's other ways that I could lower my carbon footprint. But I'm not going to judge somebody else if they're not willing to do the same thing. I mean, it would be hypocritical. I mean, I still had to fly to come to Toronto. You know, I didn't come here in a canoe. Yeah. <laughs> so... The, the, this is why this is such a divisive subject. I mean, I have family that are on the other side of the pipeline thing, where they they call it, you know, the black snake, and you know, they, but a lot of these people sometimes they don't even really know what's going on. Like we, we have people right now that are weighing in on the pipeline that didn't know that it's a natural gas pipeline. They, okay. they thought it was crude oil. I, I think there's a perception that it's uh, has to do with oil sands. People like to call it tar sands. Yeah. Uh, I know we were actually looking up, um, and only <coughs> we were actually looking up. That liquefied natural gas has to be at even minus 216 degrees Celsius to stay as liquid, and so if yeah. there's a leak, it's not you know it's a bit different than, than just an oil spill. Exactly. So I mean, and look, uh, me personally, like my personal politics, people bring this up a lot, mm -hmm. because, so I might as well just be open with everybody. Sure. I was heavily involved in I don't know more. I, I I still strongly believe in a lot of the things that that organization or that movement started. It's not really an organization; it's a movement. Mm -hmm. What what it really believed in, right? I mean. The two of the women that founded it are people that I profoundly respect because they were looking ahead and they didn't just make it about the environment. They, they, like Jessica Gordon, she was very clear that this is about Native rights. This is about mm. everything that we think is important, Native sovereignty. It's about us participating in the government. It's about us being part of Canada, like a productive part of Canada that's treated like equals rather than the way we're treated right now. Now, the issue is that we're not treated that way and that it's not uh, it's not an equal relationship and here, here's my I'll tell you my personal thing with the whole pipeline stuff it started out with some people that were very upset and felt like they didn't have a voice which is understandable what happened though was a transition from that into becoming this basically monolithic nonsense about the climate Right? Mm -hmm. So it went from being Native people saying, hey, you didn't even listen to us, you know, like we have some concerns and you, you, didn't, you didn't consult and you didn't listen, to, well, we don't care, no pipeline, no pipeline, 
right? Mm-hmm. That, that's a very different argument if yeah. you think about it. So, yeah, it's it. And then, okay, you asked me a little bit about the, the, the this hereditary chief stuff. Yes, yeah, so yeah, who are these hereditary chiefs? You said people are not listening to complaints. That's one of the people, yeah. you know, the groups that Canadians are probably familiar with. Who are these hereditary chiefs? What, what, is, what does that even mean? The easiest way to explain it is, is to explain most chief and councils are, like, a long time ago, I came up with the term Indian Act chiefs, right? Because they're, they weren't the Indian chiefs. Because everyone would say, oh, it's an Indian chief. And I would say, no, 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 uh, they're an Indian Act chief. Because... You have to remember that in, in traditional native societies, and, and not all of them, like again, various nations, various customs, but for the most part, it's, it's a it's a truism to say native leaders led, they didn't rule. Okay, now we're used to looking at things through a very European, like a, a very colonialist kind of lens, where leaders rule. The leader tells you what to do when you do it. That that's that's a very European method of leadership, right? Sure. Like with kings, monarchs, you know. Okay, okay so. That's who. That's how they. So do someone's it. the boss. They're yeah. in charge. Yeah. So whoever's in charge tells you what to do. When you do it. Where the native method of leadership was always much more organic. It was much more the the, the leaders led, but they didn't rule. Mm-hmm. So if a leader wasn't doing a good job, the leader would be gone. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's a it's a very different paradigm. Sure. Now, so we're trying to look at this now. Through, through two paradigms, right? So the native view is that in, in most traditional native societies, the chief didn't just rule and tell everybody what to do, but the chief would be in charge of doing certain things, right? Mm-hmm. So most of the time, chiefs would be in charge of anything external, sure. anything to do with other tribes, you know, war, negotiations, hunting, anything to do outside of the village, the chief looked after it. Then in most societies, they had matriarchs or clan heads, mm-hmm. And those were the people that looked after internal things, you know, determining who's going to get married to who, uh, making sure that the on a day-to-day basis that the nation ran uh, easily, right, mm-hmm. and, and calmly. Sure. So like a foreign affairs, internal affairs. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of like that. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna like break it down into yeah. a kind of how we see the world. Uh, now here's the thing: this particular nation, they have clan heads. The what's waiting nation? The what's waiting? Sorry. Yeah. So they have they have clan heads. Now these clan heads. It's somehow this got turned into people claiming that they're hereditary chiefs. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some dispute about that, how it started. I mean, I, I've been told by people in Wet'suwet'en that it was because of one particular interview where the person was trying to explain how clan heads work, and they said, it's kind of like a chief, right? Sure, so, so their analogy kind of gave birth to this. Yes, to this, this whole hereditary chief thing. The truth of the matter is very few Native nations had hereditary leaders because... Yes. How do you have a hereditary leader when most of our leadership was meritocracy? It was mm-hmm. based on, could you do the job? Did you do the job? Well, if you didn't, you were gone. Sure. Right? Which doesn't lend itself towards, oh, well, my, I was chief, so my kid will be yeah, pretty, pretty antithetical to it. <laughs> so when we're talking about uh, clan heads, so these clans, uh, in, in many cases, they were matriarchal, by the way. Uh, they, were, they were the women of the tribe that were the clan heads. But these clans, they, they're, they're like separate little groups within the nation. Okay. Now... What people don't know about Wet'suwet'en is that several of the clan heads, or what they're calling in the media hereditary chiefs, were actually pro pipeline and, and several weren't. So now what happens? Because you have the Indian Act, which says that you're governed by your chief and council that are elected by the people. So this is the government is now is forcing anyone to, this is who we're going to listen to. This is who you're yeah. going to listen to. The government shows who they're going to listen to because okay. the, the government signs the checks. This is, so when I say <laughs> the Indian Act chief, I really do mean that. Like yeah. the, the chief is not the chief of the Indians. He's not the, the, the he doesn't work for the people. So he's, he's a state. You're a crowd. He's, he's he's pretty much you know the government signs the checks. So yeah. it would be like me saying, hey, I'm autonomous and I lead these people, and then you say, okay, cool, but you know if you don't do what we say, I just won't pay you. Mm-hmm. And if you're the guy writing the checks, well then, I, who yeah. do I work for? <laughs> you know, I work for the guy that signs the checks. So. Meanwhile, these clan heads, who are more of a traditional leadership model, mm-hmm. but they're not actually involved in governance, so they wouldn't be somebody that would negotiate with the government. Mm-hmm. They are the ones that are saying, hey, you know what, there's enough of us here, we think, that are against this, that we should speak up. But then there's a, a large group that are pro-pipeline. So now, you have, even within this tribe, you have this schism. Sure. Now, this whole thing is becoming super divisive because nobody can just disagree anymore. Mm-hmm. So... It's no longer, you know what, you think that 
we should have a pipeline. I don't think we should have a pipeline. Okay, well, you give me your reasons and I'll give you mine. And, you know, maybe we'll come to an accommodation. Maybe we won't. Now it's become you're pro-pipeline. You're evil. Mm -hmm. Everything else that you say must be evil. You're a government agent. You know, like the lateral violence. You know, now you're, you're attacking me because I'm native. Like it, it's turned into these ridiculous arguments that really have nothing to do with the original problem, which is native sovereignty. Right? So now you say that the, the government has pretty much imposed this rubric of who is native, who is not. Yeah. And there's been a lot of reports in the media about people who are no, absolutely no connection to the, uh, to the West Wetton people, but are now suddenly being held up as representatives or, or some of the other protests, yeah. the real protests. Do you know, is this something that is, is common? Yeah, okay, so... Like I, I th it, it's a, this is a very uh, how do I say this nicely? This is a, <laughs> this is a dangerous area, sure, because you saw it with almost every major native rights movement. Uh, within weeks, it gets co-opted. Mm -hmm. So, like with, with I don't know more at the first little bit, it was the four ladies that started it up. They were they were in the public eye. They were the ones speaking. Within a month, we had, you know, like people like Teresa Spence. Suddenly mm -hmm. she's telling people, I'm, I'm having a hunger strike on behalf of Idle No More. Mm -hmm. And the truth was, she had nothing to do with us. She yeah. she called us and said, I'm going to use your name during my hunger strike. And some of us were like, no, we don't, <laughs> you know, we don't want chiefs involved. Because yeah. it, it was supposed to be a grassroots movement of the people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we, we obviously weren't the ones that came out on top of that argument. So what you end up with is you end up with these people that sometimes are not, not only are they not native, mm -hmm. but they don't have native's best interests at heart in sure. any way, shape, or form. So right now in Wet'suwet'en, there are people in Wet'suwet'en, and I'm probably going to take flack for even saying this, but you can do the research. <laughs> there, There's a group called Tides Foundation, mm -hmm. and they are, uh, I, I don't want to say radical, but I will say they're a fairly extreme environmental group. That has involved themselves in several different native movements, and when they do, they slowly kind of change the messaging from native sovereignty and what's good for native people into environment at all costs. Right, so they don't care whether natives are starving or not; it means nothing to them as long as we don't damage the environment. So, but isn't that on one hand a colonialist kind of imposition again, trying to force native oh, yeah. people that? The environment, that's your number one thing. That's the only thing that you guys can ever talk about? Oh, yeah. Like I, so I actually wrote an article a long time ago about this where I said, look, uh, they're colonizing the struggle against colonization, <laughs> right? Uh, Ironic. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I made a, you're, you'll get a kick out of this as a quick little aside because it, it speaks to that point. When I was with Idle No More, I created a bunch of different Facebook pages. And it was, Facebook was fairly new. Social media was new. Mm. So, I, But I knew this would be a good way to motivate people and gather people. So I created a Facebook group. And as the creator of the Facebook group, this is, I'm the guy that created the group. I got banned from the group because a white liberal wrote a post about mm -hmm. GMO potatoes and McDonald's <laughs> and why this is such a horrible thing. And no Indians should eat at McDonald's because they use GMO potatoes. So all I wrote was, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, but most Indians can't afford to eat at McDonald's. Like, and it, you know what? GMO yeah. potatoes to us is not a concern. Like if you're if you're gonna tell me I can get cheaper potatoes to feed my family, sure, yeah, you're you're, you know, like if I can't afford a regular potato, you're damn right I'm gonna so buy the cheaper one. Guy who shops at Whole Foods, yeah. is now telling you, and I was picking Whole Foods is a great super yeah. high place, but guy who shops at Whole Foods is now telling exactly. people who are who might be stuck on a reserve with no water, let alone you know fresh fresh fruit. <laughs> he's telling you, you can't. Sorry, you can't eat potatoes. Exactly. See, you, you get how ridiculous this is. A lot of people don't understand how why that's so ridiculous. And then they banned me. <laughs> you have been the administrator of the page, <laughs> who knew that I'm the person that created the page, said, "I can't believe that you're pro GMO foods." And I said, "On what planet does that come off as pro GMO foods?" Mm -hmm. All I said was. If they have a cheaper potato and I can't afford a regular potato, sure. I'm going to buy the cheaper potato. Yeah, so you're going to starve and eat some GMO yeah, potatoes. I, that's my, uh, if those are my choices, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it, it just speaks to how colonized this whole struggle has become now. Because like you just said, some dude that shops at Whole Foods is lecturing me about not even being able to buy a cheap GMO potato, mm -hmm. you know. And, and this is exactly what we're dealing with. And now you have people from the Rockefeller Foundation, and they're out in Wet'suwet'en, and they're telling Indians, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you guys got to fight this pro, uh, po, uh, pipeline at all costs. And, I mean, you have you have a few Native people out there 
some of them who have never probably had a job. And like, I, I don't want to buy into that Uncle Tom kind of, sure. but I am going to say this. I grew up in a Métis settlement. I've seen the difference between Native people who work mm-hmm. and Native people who struggle on a day-to-day basis, but they fight and struggle so they can feed their families. And I, I've seen it. I'm my own family, right? And then I've also seen Natives who give up and who decide, you know what, I'll I'll live on, like, okay, so I'll, I'll use some Native terminology. Sure. Some of these people will recognize it. People that live on dog dink hot dogs. That's what we call mm-hmm. them, you know, those red hot dogs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So people that live on dog dink hot dogs and macaroni, right? Mm-hmm. And they think that that's life. And yeah. they're barely subsisting. Like, they are, they are living in what I would consider to be worse than third world. Yeah. And yet... They think they're doing okay because they get $250, $300 a month from the government. Mm -hmm. They can afford to buy their their hot dogs that God only knows what goes in them. You know, and they they literally live on hot dogs and macaroni. And I I just, I I don't understand why when we as Native people start speaking up and saying, I I don't want to live like that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, yeah, I grew up with no power and no running water. Does that mean I want to stay living with no power and no running water? Mm -hmm. And why should I in a country like Canada? Yeah. You know? And, you know, we're talking about this pipeline as if it's the only issue, and they've made it into the only issue. And, and, and for I don't know more, it became, you know, the omnibus bills. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the omnibus bills were all about, you know, and, and, you know, I will criticize the conservative government for this. Sure. They, they were conflating 40 or 50 different little issues into one bundle and then mm-hmm. saying, okay, this is going to fix all of these things. So you couldn't really pick one thing out of those things and say, no, no, I, I like all this, but I don't like that. Yeah, it makes it hard to reject. If, if 39 yeah. of the 40 are good, it makes it hard to reject the bill, even though you may have a serious problem with the one. Exactly. And that was where the issue was coming because they were sneaking little shots at water protection in there. Mm-hmm. Like they, were, they basically took away protection for water and land sure. for Native people. Okay. But meanwhile, some of the other stuff was good stuff. Now, this, this pipeline thing is a very different issue where it's a singular issue. It's one pipeline. Mm-hmm. And... The misinformation that was put out there about it. I mean, half the people that I know tell me that no, it's not. It's not a natural gas pipeline, you idiot. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, what is it then? And then they'll tell me, oh no, it's bitumen from the tar sands. And I'm like, y- you don't know what you're talking about. Like mm-hmm. you're you're here with your son and you're freaking out and you're telling me that I'm the idiot. Mm-hmm. You don't even know that it's liquid natural gas. Like, and, and here's the other thing. Uh, this is a the elephant in the room. Native people don't want you to build pipelines through our watersheds where, sure. where we get our drinking water. We don't want pipelines going through like graveyards. I mean, that's makes kind sense. of a common sense. Yeah, right? makes sense. Like you ever watch Pet Cemetery or, or The Exorcist? <laughs> yeah, it might, might not turn yeah. out so well. Yeah, you don't, want, you don't want to go through an Indian graveyard. It never works out. But at the same time, most of us are like, look, we acknowledge the fact that we, we live in a world run on you know fossil energy. And until we come up with some better ways to do things, this is the world we live in. And a lot of us are like, we're not happy about it, and we'd like to try and wean ourselves off of that stuff, but we know that it's not going to be instant. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we get these environmentalist people that that lecture us and come and say, well, if you acknowledge the fact that, you know, we need fossil fuels right now, then you're an Uncle Tom, Mm -hmm. or you're you're a government agent, or you work for the the big oil companies, right? And it's really... It's destructive because somebody like me who's dedicated their life to indigenous rights has people sometimes saying shit like that to me. And I have people flat out tell me, you know, I can't believe that you said that the people in Wet'suwet'en are divided. And I was like, well, am I wrong? Like, do you know anybody in Wet'suwet'en? I, I'll be honest, I only know a few people. Mm-hmm. But the people that I know, they can't even agree. Even between themselves. They're, they're even between not. themselves, they can't agree. So, you know, we're, we're not a monolithic people. So we moved from pipelines and the original sort of discussion about what, you know, the pros and the cons should it be, who's, who's getting listened to, who's not. Yeah. Now we're at a stage where people are blockading railroads, they're trying to shut down infrastructure, there's a hashtag shut down Canada. Yeah. And the government, I think, has been rightly criticized for being a little inactive, showing a, a lack of leadership on this. Where do you think the government could go and how would you rate the Trudeau government's response to this situation overall? So their response to the situation is somewhere between abject moronic <laughs> and pathetic. That's that's their, their reaction. Tell us what you really think. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they could have they could have easily just bypassed all of this nonsense with one simple thing. And it would have put the onus on the people in Wet'suwet'en and we would have avoided all the blockades and all the solidarity movements. Mm-hmm. All they had to do is say, okay, you know what? 
We're going to come to Wet'suwet'en. We're going to sit down with the elected chief and council because mm-hmm. that is, according to the Indian Act and according to Canadian law, that are your rep- those are your representatives. Mm-hmm. As to whether or not they're actually representing the will of the people, that could be argued. Sure. Right? We will also sit down with your with your clan heads. We, you with know, with the hereditary chiefs. So those type of people. Sorry, yeah, I, I should use the terms <laughs> that everyone's using. So with the hereditary chiefs, they could be in the meeting as well. Sure. And more importantly, the people. Right? You make the mm-hmm. you make the meeting open. None of this secret behind closed doors nonsense. Mm-hmm. You have a, a, a band meeting where you invite everybody in the community and you say, Okay, mm-hmm. tell us your concerns. How do you really feel about this? Mm-hmm. And at the end of the meeting, after everybody has the full information where you tell them not bitumen, not mm-hmm. tar sands. Yes, we are amenable to avoiding going through water to watersheds, mm-hmm. you know. <coughs> if they would have done that, all of this would have been avoided, mm-hmm. right? But instead, they ignored it. They thought, oh, you know, it's just a, it's a bunch of white liberal hippies and a couple Indians, and they're hanging out in the middle of nowhere where nobody goes anyway. It's mm-hmm. not an important place. Oh, they're blockading a road. Nobody goes over there, so it doesn't matter. We'll just mm. ignore it. It'll all go away. That's their. Mm. That's the typical liberal government benign neglect. Mm. That's that's their. That's been the liberal government's policy towards Indians since John A. Macdonald, right? It's mm. benign neglect. If we if we just ignore the problem, eventually it'll go away on its own. Mm. Now, the issue is that it didn't go away. Clearly, uh, more and more native people are using the pipeline. And, and the Wet'suwet'en stuff to actually advocate for their stuff that's going on, mm-hmm. which is good and bad. The problem so is... Not, so not, something has maybe nothing to do, still a First Nations yeah. indigenous issue, but but not about yeah. pipelines now. So, okay, so the, the, the Mohawk in Tainadega, mm-hmm. right? They have nothing to do with Wet'suwet'en. Sure, it's across very, the country. Yeah, like, very far. It, it's across the country, but they, they've had a lot of issues, that community, with the government. A mm-hmm. lot of issues. So... They took a good opportunity and they said, okay, well, in solidarity with these guys, mm-hmm. we're going to do our own blockade. Sure. Now, hopefully, and, and, and this is it goes to one of your other points, hopefully what they're doing, though, is hopefully they have some prepared asks. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you don't have an ask, there's no point in having a protest. Yeah, I guess people don't know what it is that you yeah, want. Like, yeah, it would be like me saying, I protest against murder and racism. It's like... Okay, cool. Like everybody hates murder; it's bad, mm-hmm. and racism is bad. You know, like so. What do you want? Well, I just don't want murder and racism. <laughs> it's like okay, but how specifically are we going to deal with this issue? I mean, mm-hmm. it's really easy to say I don't like murder and racism. Sure, it's not so easy to come up with a way to prevent murders and racism. Mm-hmm. So, I'm hoping that they're, they're they're smart enough to put together some cohesive plans, some some actual asks. Mm-hmm. But so far, I haven't really seen much of that. And that's part of the issue, too, because we see these people on TV talking about Native concerns. Mm-hmm. And then when they're asked a specific question about it, like, okay, well, what do you, how do you think that looks? Like, what, what are you asking us? Mm-hmm. And then people are shocked when the average Canadian is looking at the TV watching this and saying, well, how the hell do I support these people when mm-hmm. they're not actually asking me for anything? Yeah. Like, like, yeah, we know. We get it. Indians got screwed. Like, I think at this point, everybody in Canada realizes that the way we were treated as Native people was terrible. I mean, I don't think anybody is going to argue against that. Sure, residential schools and other... Okay. Exactly. And so, like, I made a joke on Twitter about... uh, (laughs) I call it reconciliation. (laughs) Okay. Because... Or reconciliation. Because it's not reconciliation. They don't really want to say sorry. They want us to assimilate. Sure. So they say sorry enough to get us to be like everybody else. But... The truth mm-hmm. is that if you want real reconciliation, instead of saying sorry all the time, mm-hmm. which we know... So the tears didn't really... Yeah, you know, like doing the... Yeah, the whole, you know, look at my fancy socks, but now I'm going to cry a tear for the indigenous people. Mm-hmm. Like, that didn't convince anybody. Mm-hmm. Right? Sure. What would convince us is saying, you know what? We're really sorry about the crappy way that you've been treated. And now, in order to show you, instead of just tell you that we're sorry, mm-hmm. we're going to come up with some actual ways to help your community. Right? Like... They, how many years have they been talking about clean drinking water? Mm-hmm. And That's something I've been personally involved in uh, with, with you, actually. Yeah, exactly. So there's a big difference between Sam Eskenazi saying, hey, you know what? Mm-hmm. This is really crappy. These people don't have clean drinking water. So I'm going to do something about it, yeah. right? Versus the government saying, oh, it's horrible. They don't have any clean drinking water. We're going to fix that and then doing nothing, yeah. right? Or whatever they're doing is extremely ineffective. Where you saw a problem and you dealt with it 
the way most people do. You see a problem, you try to come up with a, a viable solution mm-hmm. instead of just talking about the problem. Yeah. So this is another issue that we have like with, as Native Canadians is that a lot of times our advocates don't really even understand what we're advocating for. Mm-hmm. And then we have people that aren't really Native. That hurts, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like Because then they're not even really Native and you see some white liberal hippie guy on TV and he comes out with his peace brother and all that nonsense mm-hmm. and then the next words out of his mouth are, and we're going to blockade this bridge until you do what we say. And it's like, okay, but okay, then what do you want us to do? Oh, well, well, we'll, we'll get to that. It's like, well, shouldn't you have that prepared before you blockade the bridge? You know? So you touched on a couple, so the last kind of thing I wanted to ask is how does this interplay with sort of the East-West divide that we're seeing in Canada? Because there's, there's a lot of Western yeah. anger, and I think rightfully so, about the economic conditions or stopping Alberta, for example, uh, from exporting some natural resources that its economy depends on so strongly. Uh, how is this kind of affecting the, the East-West divide? And, and I mean, you're from out West. Yeah. You know, what is your take? Okay, so that's an even tougher one because a lot of people out West really do feel like the East not only takes us for granted, but it's more of uh, like when you send that much money mm-hmm. over the course of, three or four decades Mm -hmm. and somebody like me goes to university and I find out from a a friend of mine on my football team Mm -hmm. that he paid not even a tenth of what I paid for tuition. Mm -hmm. You find out that his girlfriend who had a kid got free daycare while Mm -hmm. she was in university. Meanwhile, my friends with kids when they were in university had to pay. And then, sorry, this is different university. uh, So we're talking University of Alberta versus Concordia or Bishops. Okay. Right? So... I found out that this teammate of mine that went to Bishops, he paid as much for his degree Mm -hmm. that I paid for one semester. So, you know, when you find stuff like that out, then you realize that a lot of that was paid for with transfer money. Mm -hmm. Like, and once you actually do a little bit of digging and you realize how much money was sent Mm -hmm. in these equalization payments. And, and you got to remember, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Mm -hmm. right? So when I did a job, my, my part-time job when I was a kid, was working outside most of the mm-hmm. time, right? You're working outside and it's 30, 40 below, and you yeah. feel like, yeah, you know what? I get paid 20 bucks, 25 bucks an hour. I'm I'm doing okay. And then you find out that some other dude was, you know, basically parking cars in Montreal, mm-hmm. and, and he got the same amount that I was getting paid. Sure. And you ask yourself, like, wait a second, I had to live in this miserable place. Yeah. I had to do this hard work. The You're sweating, cold. breaking your back. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, this guy paid like a tenth of what I paid for tuition and all these different benefits. And you start thinking to yourself, why? Mm. Like, like, it doesn't make sense. And now with this pipeline stuff and people out east are like, you know, it's funny because a lot of people out east are super anti-pipeline without mm. even knowing what's going on. And it's like, okay, but you realize that most of what you have in this economy came from us. Mm. Like, the fact that Canada was one of the few countries that didn't have a huge depression a couple of years ago came strictly because of our... Energy sector. It's like the petrodollar. Yeah. And, and it, so it's like you have all these things that you don't even real you, you take it totally for granted. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people at West are fed up with that. And this whole thing with this last election, you know, like we came right out and said, we, we don't want Trudeau. Like mm-hmm. he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's about as, he's the worst mm-hmm. candidate. And I, I can remember friends of mine out east, mm-hmm. like even more east than we are right now. Sure. Just to us. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know Toronto's the center of the world. Toronto, Toronto is. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, to us, the east east is even more so like sure. Newfoundland. And sure, sure. I had friends in Newfoundland laughing at me. They were literally laughing at me and saying, that must really piss you off that before the election's even halfway over, you already know that your vote doesn't count. So basically yeah. mocking you saying, I don't yeah. know, because of the time zones. Yeah. They're like, it doesn't even matter, Ryan. He's like, just get used to it. You're going to have Trudeau again. And, and I, like, luckily, I'm not one of those people that's like, you know, oh, my God, it's true. <laughs> but I was, I, was, I was irritated about it. And I said, look, you know what does bother me is that you contribute nothing mm. monetarily or economically to this country. We contribute everything. And yet you feel comfortable mocking me because I'm telling you this guy is bad for the economy. And he's bad for the country. And then, you know, the gun stuff, don't even get started sure. on that. <laughs> So, I mean... So, just yeah. sort of, you know, being someone from Ice, who's born and raised in Toronto. Yeah. Does anyone have a gun? What's with, you know, <laughs> why, why does anyone care about guns so much? Okay, so, where I grew up, in northern Alberta, every house has a gun. Mm-hmm. Every, every single house. And you have a gun because of bears, wolves. I mean, it's just a... It's, it's a reality sure. of life, right? So, for, for to tell somebody like me that, you know, we're, we're going to take the guns away, we're like, no. 
Mm-hmm. No, that that's not going to happen. And the funny thing is, a lot of police officers in Alberta, because they know the situation, they're like, "Yeah, we would. We're not going to do it. We won't. Mm-hmm. We won't apply that law. Yeah, they're, they're not going to confiscate people's guns. guns." A lot of them said point blank, "We're not confiscating people's guns. Like mm-hmm. that's that's a stupid, stupid thing to ask." Mm-hmm. But a lot of people out here, I mean, you call a police officer here. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're in Toronto, right? Sure. A bear walks in the back of your yard. I know it's a. It's it's a, a yeah, yeah. Unlike the possibility. Yeah, sure. So it's like, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a Toronto bear. I mean, a very large raccoon, maybe. Yeah, maybe a big rac- <laughs> fat raccoon, right? But no, he comes in your backyard and he's standing right there. Now, you can call police, animal control. Sure. Someone's going to be here within 15 minutes. Sure. Yeah. Because it's, it's a dangerous situation. If we call a police officer in Paddleberry, sometimes it takes up to an hour and a half, sure. two hours. Now, I have some of the That's RCMP. That's the RCMP. Yeah. So. If my kids are playing outside and a bear comes walking in the yard, mm. I don't have an hour and a half to wait for the police. Yeah. I take my rifle and I go outside and I kill the bear. Uh, you know, mm. I, that's just the way it is. That's a reality of life. So to us, that's a big deal. Mm. You know, for someone to say they're going to take away what we consider to be our safety, mm. right? There's all these different things. And the other thing about the East and West that's a huge divide is that, you know, we, we feel like we earned a lot of money. Mm. And yet, roads in, in Alberta are sometimes really in poor condition. And those are the roads that transported all the stuff so that we could send money for transfer payments, you know? Yeah. We feel like we, there, there's no rail line between Edmonton and Calgary. Really? Yeah. There, there should have been a passenger rail line and a, you know, a domestic transport line. Mm. Like, it should have been. That should have been done years ago, yeah. but they always put it off, and they always said, oh, no, that's going to be billions of dollars. We need to send money east to make I, sure everybody... I've got to admit, that's actually shocking to me. I, I, mean, I would just assume two very large cities would have some, some, you know, some serious infrastructure connections. Yeah, and that, this is uh, this is the issue. Like, There's a lot of stuff like that. And when you go to when you go to Calgary, you realize that you know our, they built South Health Campus, which is a really nice hospital. Mm-hmm. That's the only new hospital they've built recently, and this is in a city of 2 million people. Hmm. So we have four hospitals, I think, which is not enough for two million people. I, I mean, these are the kinds of things that uh, that a lot of people from Alberta are really concerned about. And now, be, basically being laughed at. This is the thing. It, it was the national tone of things. Sure. Right. There were there were articles in newspapers where people are like, "Oh, shut up, Alberta, get over it." Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is that really the way you talk to somebody? That that. Is that how you would talk to your dad? Because we kind of feel like we're the dad in the situation with sure. money. You know, like, sure, yeah, pain, yeah. Like, dad, dad, can I five bucks to go to the store? Dad, can I have yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then being made fun of. Like, oh, you have a shitty job, dad. Your job is so sucky. Like, it's the worst job in the world. <laughs> like, okay, cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So we should, probably shouldn't give you any more money then, right? Mm-hmm. And, and this is, you know, well, this is the situation we're in. And, mm-hmm. and Native people, how that plays in with us, this, mm-hmm. is, a, this is another interesting thing is that there are a lot of native people that are fed up with the government mm. we don't feel like the government listens to us and some of us have actually said what would it look like if we were alberta mm. and not the rest of the country yeah and how would we deal with the government because people also don't understand this treaties aren't with the canadian government oh no i'm not aware of that yet. every treaty is signed with the crown mm. now we're technically we are supposed to be a constitutional monarchy we're not. We know that. We know that we're not really, there's not really much to do with the Queen here anymore. Sure. But the treaties were between the Crown and, and the people. Mm-hmm. Now, so what does that mean? How are we going to deal with that? The Indian Act. The Indian Act is a, is a very problematic piece of legislation. It, it's it's how Indians are governed in this country. Mm-hmm. But the problem with the Indian Act is that it's, to be blunt, it's racist. And it is not, it, it doesn't take into account our best interests. So, you know, if there was a new government that was only Alberta, well, then we would no longer be governed under the Canadian Indian Act. We mm. have to so suddenly, all those uh, technically that legislation, that governing legislation, yeah. poof, gone, just gone. So then, the, how how would we protect treaty lands? How would we protect native mm. land? You know, like those are those are legitimate questions that a lot of native people are asking, but people don't realize. At least I don't think they don't realize that a lot of times the reason native people are asking these questions is because we're strongly considering. Mm. I mean. Look at the, the number of Native people that don't vote. Mm. If all of them decided at once to vote for, for a party, that would be a significant swing vote because it's, it's new voters yeah. and it's a significant number. But the problem is a lot of us don't vote and we stay disconnected from the system. Mm. So that's another reason why the government doesn't really listen to us because why would they? 
if not not an active constituency in their in their political calculations. Exactly. If, if they're not, if there's no upside for them, then why would they even take? Because they know they're going to alienate a certain number of the conservative base. Mm. Because a lot of conservative people don't really want to do much with Indians, mm. so they'll alienate any of those people, and there's no upside because those ba- those votes don't get balanced by Native people. So what do you think the um, sort of background on that one is there? So you said, you know, they, the, some of the base might not want to have anything to do or too much to do with. Like, what's yeah. the kind of background on that? What do you think the causes for these things can well, be move forward from it? We, we could, but here, here's the issue, right? And I don't want people to think I'm conservative bashing because I'm not, but there is a strong push from a lot of people that are on the conservative side of the fence that they don't really want to do a whole lot to do with the Indians. They think that the status quo is fine and that, you know, they never want to admit that Canada's history is a little bit problematic. They'll sure. you know, they're the people that white is right. Sure. And I'm not even talking about white supremacy. I'm not even going to get into that. They're sure, just sure. the basic, you know, white bread, this is who I am, I'm a European Canadian. Those sure. guys. Now, then on top of that, then you go farther right and you have the actual racists that mm-hmm. actually hate Indians. But then on the on the liberal side of things, we have the you know the white knights. Mm. They're, they're going to save us. And they're going to do everything for us. But at the same time, those are the same people that created the residential school system. Mm. You know, they're going to save us by making us more like white people. They're going to save us by teaching us how to be white, mm. right? Instead of saying, hey, you know what? These people have a legitimate culture and language. We should let them keep that, and we should be helping them be more participatory in Canada. Mm. That. That would be the nice way to do it. Sure. So feeling so squeezed, I guess, from both sides. On, on Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and for us, it, it's hard because no government has ever been good for natives. Sure. Like, there have been li- liberal governments. The liberal government's the one that started the white paper. You know, that was Trudeau. That was, mm-hmm. that was uh, Trudeau's dad. Elder Trudeau. Elder Trudeau. Yeah, Elder Trudeau. <laughs> that sounds weird. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like, Elder Trudeau wrote the white paper, which was basically telling Indians, we don't want you to be Indians. Mm. Like, you're going to be like everybody else, which is... You know, to us, that's a that's a that's a flat out call to. I hate to say it because I don't like to misuse words. Sure. It's a call to genocide. It's like sure. saying you don't deserve to be here as Indians. Now, if you want to be more like white people, you can sure. Say so it's like a call. It's, it's definitely, definitely cultural, maybe even a physical, depending. Yeah, well, yeah just depending, depending how they're going to do it. Sure, yeah. yeah. And like you know, with with stuff like the residential schools, uh, I've had this talk with you before. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't like to use the word genocide, but. What happened to my people was a genocide. Now we're, we're experiencing the echoes sure. of that genocide. So they're not actively... And look, anybody that says they are is, is one of those people I don't even pay attention to. But they're not actively trying to kill us. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like in Nicaragua where they murdered 19 Miagna activists, mm-hmm. I think, like three weeks ago. They sure. just machine gunned them. Yeah. That doesn't happen in Canada. Sure. You do it quietly. Yeah, exactly. We do stuff a little more on the down low. You yeah. know, it's more cultural, slowly remove their language, you know, mm-hmm. take their kids and stick them with white foster families. Sure. That kind of stuff. But those are echoes of a genocide. Those mm-hmm. are those are echoes of genocidal policies. They're not actual genocide. And the problem is again, language. Sure. Because if I if I tell you, Sam, you're 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 trying to commit a genocide on my people mm-hmm. and you're like, wait a minute, my people went through a genocide. Sure. Right? And then you're like, but it wasn't anything like what you're going through. Mm-hmm. So are you more or less likely to be inclined towards feeling empathy to me when sure. I do that? I would argue that you'd be less inclined. So this is that um, sort of distinction between, you know, facts don't care about your feelings, but we still have to take people's feelings into account because yeah. obviously we need to work together ultimately. Exactly. And like, so this is why I tell people, look, like precision of language mm-hmm. is so important because I, I, I will come right up and say that, our, our situation right now as, as natives in Canada mm-hmm. is worlds better than it's ever been, okay? That doesn't mean it's it's where it needs to be. It doesn't mean that it's good. Mm-hmm. It's just better than it's ever been. Mm-hmm. I don't have to get permission to leave the reserve. I don't have to go to the Indian agent and mm-hmm. beg him to let me go off reserve to go work, yeah. right? That's something that my dad's generation had to do. I, I can speak openly anywhere any time about native rights and I don't have to worry that I'm going to get thrown in jail or murdered mm. right that's that's worlds different than how it is in other places mm. but for some reason people think that if we exaggerate and make blow things up and use words like genocide and you know like mm. words that are very inflammatory it's going to make things better and it doesn't because then the average canadian is sitting there thinking you know like I I like I've been to casino rama sure. you know <laughs> like you know, it doesn't look so bad there and they, they don't go to, like, the really bad reserves. But, sure. you know, a lot of natives have seen some of these more urban reserves, you know. Mm. 
they see those, they're like, it doesn't look so bad, right? So it's it's sort of a mix between a lack of education on some people's part, yeah. not understanding where some of the anger and frustration is coming from, exactly. then outside groups taking that anger and then deciding yeah, I'm yeah. going to use it for another purpose that may not actually align <laughs> with the First Nation community, yeah. and then the First Nation community getting screwed once again because they've lost their voice a second time when they were just about to get it. Is that sort of a good recap? A hundred percent. Like... Like Standing Rock, right? Sure. Perfect example. Bunch of people show up. Everybody for about a, three or four months on social media was posting selfies with signs saying, mm-hmm. I stand with Standing Rock. And then there were a bunch of arrests. Some guys did some really dumb stuff. They arrested, I think, 75 people. 25 of those people got bailed out right away. They went home. 25 of those people stayed for a little bit longer, got bailed, went home. 25 people still in jail. Hmm every single one of them an Indian. And then a friend of mine took a video of the campground where all those people were staying and it looks like a dump. And who gets stuck cleaning it up? Yeah. Native people. Hmm. And all the people that were there that were, to, to, to put it bluntly, white people that sure. showed up and, and provo- provoked and talked all kinds of smack. Well, they all left. Mummy and daddy paid their bail. Hmm. They didn't have to stay in jail. But there's Indians that are still in jail because they don't have the money to pay bail. So they're going to stay for the full 90 days or whatever it is. They're stuck in jail the whole time. And meanwhile, there's a huge ass mess on the reserve that all these wonderful people that were standing in solidarity came and they left this big mess. Mm. And it's Indians left holding the bag. So it's kind of like a protest tourism kind of, you know, you do it for kicks <laughs> after, you know, after university. Yeah, we call it tragedy tourism. Yeah. Okay. Because it's it's like, you know, they, they want to come and be all activisty for a couple days and mm-hmm. then go home. And, and meanwhile, Native people, that's that's their life. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so it's frustrating. Right, well, any uh, any final thoughts? I mean, like I said, there's a lot a lot going on. Uh, you know, any final thoughts about where you think or where you'd like to see uh, the situation sure. go? Okay, so you, you and I talked about this, and I talked about it with Amanda a while ago, and I think that the biggest thing is that I, I like that Native people are speaking up, right? Because the problem is that, it, especially within Canada, Native people don't feel comfortable to speak up unless everyone else is speaking up at the same time, mm. which is why you're seeing all these different blockades pop up at the same time, right? Sure. But what I would really like to see, uh, I don't want to see people blockading highways or blockading streets because the truth is that's going to alienate the very people that we're trying to appeal to. I, I mean, if we're going to make changes in Canada, we need the average Canadian on side. We need them to understand that what happened to us is wrong mm. and that you know, talking about reconciliation and acting on reconciliation are very different. That it's not just throw some money at the problem and hope it goes away. There needs to be more thought put into this. Uh, but more importantly for Native people, I, I want people to understand that, that look, those people, don't rep- they don't represent all Native people. I don't represent all Native people. Mm-hmm. Nobody represents all Native people. It's, these are, we're all very, we're not monolithic. We're all very different. But we're all people. And we want people to understand that, look, there, there are some situations in Canada that need to change. There are problems that need to be fixed. And I'm saying this within my mm-hmm. own community. I'm not, I'm not just going to point fingers and say that this is all about white Canada being racist. Sure. It's not. It's, it's, it's not. But, but are there issues still with systemic racism? Absolutely. Are there issues still where Native people aren't comfortable speaking up? Absolutely. Don't ever read the comments on any article. <laughs> that has anything to do with Native people because you will start to despise mankind. Mm -hmm. It's that bad. And the racism is so in your face in those comments that all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, it's not, uh, Mm -hmm. we're not where we need to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I I want you to keep doing what you're doing because, I mean, you do good work. And a lot of these people that are out there just trying to say, hey, look, you know what? Let Instead of immediately jumping to judgment, let's let's do some research. Let's Mm -hmm. dig into this. Let's talk to some different people because... You know, like we're we're in such a polarized world right now that, like, you know, with left and right mm-hmm. and white and dark, and nobody just says, "Oh, well, you know, maybe we should just look at the facts and then, then make some judgments based on those." Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so I'm really hoping that you know, in the next couple months, especially, we can maybe drag the conversation away from this, you know, all or nothing maximalism mm-hmm. to being more like normal people and saying, "Hey, you know what?" Ryan doesn't believe 100% in the pipelines, but he's also not 100% anti-pipeline. Ryan thinks 
we should have pipelines, but don't run them through watersheds and graveyards. Mm -hmm. and, and actually talk to the people whose land you're going to go through before you do it. Like, I don't think that that's too much to ask. Yeah. But I also don't think that we should be freezing in the cold, in the dark. You know, I, I wouldn't like that. Yeah. So... Yeah. Right. Well, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. Um, you know, I think you've given people a lot of stuff to um, digest and think about. I know, like I said, I, I you know, being someone who was born and raised in Toronto, a lot, a lot of stuff about out west that suddenly became more real for me after this conversation. Um, if someone wants to uh, get a hold of you, you're on Twitter. What is your Twitter handle? Uh, it's at Fenner sixty nine. All right. So if you uh, would like to have a, ask uh, a question of Ryan. Uh, or if you would like to be trolled back by Ryan after you make offensive comments, he is an excellent uh, uh, comeback artist. Uh, please reach out to him on Twitter. I'm Sam Ashkenazi. Once again, this is Ryan Bellows, Indigenous rights activist. And uh, thank you so much for watching.